Proverbs chapter number 18. We'll begin reading in verse number 1. The Bible says, Through desire a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. When the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt, with ignominy reproach. And with ignominy reproach. Now, as you may or may not know, the book of Proverbs, one of my, if not the favorite book of mine in the Bible, and occasionally you will find in the book of Proverbs a few verses back to back that kind of relate to one another. Other times you can be reading through a chapter of the book of Proverbs and each verse is an individual thought that has nothing to do with the verse before it or the verse after it. Okay, but here in this chapter, the first three verses, Lord's given me a thought where all three of them have to do with the same thought. But I want you to notice first in verse number one. It says, Through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Now again, wisdom, very common word. I'd say maybe the most popular word in the book of Proverbs. I've never done a count because I haven't had the time to sit down and count how many times the word wisdom is in the book of Proverbs, but it's in there a lot, I promise you that. Along with knowledge or understanding. And all three of those words refer to one thing from the author of Proverbs, King Solomon. He's referring to knowledge of God. It's not talking about the wisdom of men. In the Proverbs, wisdom's not talking about the wisdom of, let's say, a preacher. It's talking about wisdom or truth that comes from God. Understanding is understanding the truth of God. Knowledge is knowing the truth of God. Because the first ten chapters of the book of Proverbs talk about how no one in Solomon's day sought after wisdom like they desired, or he desired for the people of Israel to do. And he wasn't talking about go out and get a college education. Oh, there's nothing wrong with the college education. In fact, nowadays, 90% of the jobs out there in the world require you to have a bare minimum bachelor's degree or college education. But sometimes you can get an associate's degree. But you need some schooling in order to get jobs nowadays. Okay, well, it's not talking about that wisdom, although there's nothing wrong with that wisdom. If you want to be a welder like Brother Phil, go learn how to weld. I can't teach you that. You've got to go find that somewhere else. There is no chapter and verse on how to weld in the Bible. Okay, you're going to have to look elsewhere for that wisdom. Okay, but here in the book of Proverbs, it's talking about the wisdom of God. True wisdom does not come from man. It comes from God. If you believe the Bible, everything that we know, God has told us. Or God gave us the capability to find out. What do you think, Genesis 1 1, in the beginning? Were you there? No. Was Moses there? No. How did he find out about it? God told him. Everything that man knows about God comes from this book. Because God told us, because we weren't smart enough to figure it out on our own. The book tells us that man is without excuse. We can look around at all creation and know that nothing that it was made was made by anything else that was made. That the very soul of man knows that there is a God, but we didn't know anything about him unless he would have told us. After Adam and Eve sinned, God could have cut off ties with humanity right there, and we would have been left with what Adam and Eve learned while they were walking with God in the cool of the day and what they learned. But God inspired holy righteous men that tried to live right before God to pin down what God revealed unto them. What's that? Wisdom. Truth. And if we desire it, we can have understanding and we can have that knowledge. So that's why it's so important whenever you see the word wisdom in the book of Proverbs. So I talk about the wisdom of man. Sometimes it's talking about horse sense, but who gave you that horse sense? God. It's talking about Understanding what God wants you to know. And we don't have time to get into it. But that could be different for everybody. Certainly the pastor of the church has to know and be more well-rounded and well-versed in the doctrines of the Bible than, let's say, somebody that just got saved. There are different degrees of what God wants you to know. If God wants you to be a soul winner, you may have all the skills that it takes to walk up to somebody, strike up a conversation, and just be able to become a friend with them. Right? If you're a person that works in the AV department of the church, 
You may have knowledge that God desires you to know that other people don't know. But spiritually, there are some things that all of us need to know. Individually, we all are required to stand before God one day and say, I either knew everything you wanted me to know, or I didn't. Because there's no in-between with God. It's either y'all in, or y'all out. It's either holiness or sin. It's either obedience or disobedience. There are no half measures. So when, Solomon wrote, that man seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. Intermeddleth means that you can't tell where one starts and the other one ends. Means that you become part of what you're... Think of it as mixing something together. You could throw flour, sugar, a whole bunch of stuff. But you turn on that mixer, you turn on the blender, or whatever it is that you're using to stir it up. By the time you get done, you can't tell what's what anymore. It has become part of something else. And part of that new creature that God wants to turn us into, he wants to intermeddle us with not only wisdom, but himself. Didn't the Apostle Paul write that... You know, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. What's that? That's getting the flesh out and getting Christ in. It's getting the wisdom of the Word of God in us. Not only so that we can live as He would have us to live, because He said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Because He expects us to take up our cross daily and follow Him. That He expects, non-negotiable, that we love Him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. That we give all of ourselves to God because we were bought with a price. If we give him all, he'll get what's in our noggin. He'll get the desire to get in the book and learn more about him, learn more about what he wants us to do, and learn more about how he wants us to do it. So when it says intermeddleth, it's just going to be a part of you. You're going to want to commit the word of God to your heart that you might not sin against him. You're going to desire to know, and it becomes ingrained in your soul. Just like David said, thy word have I hid in my heart. That we are to engrave certain things upon the fleshy tables of our heart, that they become a part of us. That's what intermeddleth means. We've got access to all of it, and we just get blended in with it. Or it gets blended into us. Okay, but verse number two. A fool, well, what's a fool? Fool is somebody that is foolish. They do without thinking. But biblically, a fool refers to someone that doesn't do because they think it's the right thing. They do it because it feels good. A fool only considers what the carnal man desires. Okay, so a fool hath no delight in understanding. If all you want to do is appease the flesh, live like the world, act like the world, sound like the world... Be a, if you want to intermeddle with the world instead of the word of God and instead of being with God and intermeddling with him if you want to do that you're going to hate understanding you're going to hate wisdom because what does this book tell us how awful and sinful the flesh is but how great God is how unrighteous man is but how worthy the Lamb of God was this book tells us how we are not like God so that we seek him to become more like him. And for salvation, couldn't be like him without the blood. After we get saved. Can't be like him if I've got more of the flesh. Man cannot serve two masters. I love one and hate the other. So the fool, the one that lives after the flesh, who wakes up and his first thought is fleshly, who goes to bed and his last thought is fleshly, who junks the things of God because the understanding that comes from them convicts him and shows him that he is not right with God that fool hates understanding he hates getting in the word of God because God with loving kindness God doesn't beat him over the head with it but with loving kindness and long suffering he says I love you but you're not good enough on your own but because I love you I made a way because I was good enough Somebody that has no desire for the things that God hates hearing that. Because, let's be honest, sinners know that they've got a problem. They may not know what it is. They may not know how to fix it, but they know that deep down in here, there's a problem. And they know they have a problem, and some of them, when they hear it, like Brother Luther Spivey, for example, Brother Luther thought that God couldn't save him because of all the things that he was required to do when he served our country in Vietnam as a sniper. 
He thought that Jesus couldn't love him. And when somebody thinks that they have no value, when they are their biggest critic, when they hate themselves for the things that they do, the last thing they want to hear is that somebody loves them. They hate the understanding that God does care about them even if they don't care about themselves. Because it pulls on something down here and convicts them or convinces them that they need to get close to God. So they reject it. They despise it. And in verse number 2 it says, they have no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. He rejects understanding to again embrace the heart. And in the Word of God, the heart is always the seat of emotion. Right? If the Bible refers to your heart, that's talking about the things that you feel and the things that you desire. So, it's the flesh. But God, after he saves you, he'll give you new desires in your heart. Because you can rule and reign over the flesh as a king because we were robed in his righteousness. You can control what your heart desires, but the carnal man wants to allow his heart to discover itself. Now think about what that really means. I'm going to make a t-shirt, Brother Brian. I saw something this week. It made me laugh. I'm going to put it on a t-shirt one day. But before I can make this one, I've got to put a few of Brother Phil's quotes on a t-shirt and start selling those. But, like Judas, that idiot, that's going on a shirt one day. I love that one. But anyway, saw a picture this week. And at the top of it, because Valentine's Day was last week, it said, follow your heart. And then right underneath of it, it said, false. The heart is deceitfully wicked. Follow Jesus. Right, well, it's true. The heart is deceitfully wicked. No man can know it. But the fool's desire is to discover his own heart. Is to find out what really is in there. That's a scary thing. I don't even know what I'm capable of. There's one person, and not in this room, but there's only one person that knows what's going on down in here, and that's the person of Christ Jesus. It's God the Father. That's the Holy Spirit. I don't even know what my heart's capable of, but a fool wants to find out what he's capable of. He wants to give himself completely over to the desires of the flesh. The Bible gives a name to those kind of people. They test out worthless, and God turns them over to a reprobate mind. Because they have no desire, they have no joy, they have no delight in the understanding of God. And God says, I've given you chance after chance, and turns them over to a reprobate mind, to where their conscience is seared with a hot iron, and they will pursue their own heart to their own eternal destruction. Because you start trying to figure out what's in your heart, it's a whole lot of things. And it may not be in there now, but your flesh is capable of creating new desires. Because just like anything, whether it's Advil, you take too much Advil, Advil kind of wears off on you. Doesn't have the same effect anymore. Take too much Tylenol, same thing. You take too many antibiotics, then you get like swine flu or something. Okay? You take too much of a pain medication, it loses its effect. And then you've got people that are on stronger and stronger pain medicine until they're on fentanyl popsicles and their teeth are falling out because the stuff's so strong. You say, that's not true. I know a guy. He had a horrific accident, and the doctors say that there's no way that he wasn't in constant pain all the time. But even fentanyl, he was having two or three of them little popsicle sticks a day. You say, how'd that happen? Well, it didn't start that way. He got used to it. Well, your flesh, you can appease your flesh with something today, but tomorrow your flesh will require something stronger to appease it again. And then stronger and stronger and stronger until you're not in the hog pen with the prodigal son. You way past that. You look at him and think, man, that guy's living good. You get to the point that your heart doesn't care. Your flesh doesn't care about how you're doing, how you're feeling. Doesn't care about you know, longevity and preserving you because the flesh knows it's going back to the ground. This isn't going to heaven. It's going back to the dirt. I got, I'm going to have a new body like his. He said, I'm not even going to change the one you got. I'm going to give you a better one. The flesh knows that it's cursed with sin, that it's going back to the ground. So it doesn't care if it destroys itself. But it seeks the most pleasure before it destroys itself or before it's destroyed and it returns back to the dirt. 
Now you say, what, what's all I'd have to do? If you seek out your own heart to fulfill the desires of your heart, you'll end up in verse 3. When the wicked cometh, you will be wicked. Not sin I'm talking completely every thought, as in the days of Noah, were evil continually, that will be you. There are people like that in the world. They're, I mean, you may live around some of them. That everything that they do, they go to the job just so that they can have money to fulfill the vices of the flesh. Then they start missing work because the vices become more important to them. Amen. Then they're willing to do anything and everything, whether it's cutting copper out of a house and then selling it at a pawn shop just to get one more fix or stealing from family members. Why? Because they crave and they need to fulfill the desires of the heart because they've gone all in. They're miserable and everything that they've tried makes them more miserable. So they're clinging on to every last string. Well, they're wicked. What did the people of Sodom and Gomorrah do? They turned the natural use of the woman into an abomination because woman laid with woman. Then men laid with men which is why nowadays we call them sodomites. They tried to break in and started a mob to get into Lot's house to try and take advantage of two angels, which, let's be honest, if it was one of them cherubims, the whole city didn't stand a chance. Amen. Them guys whipped a whole bunch more in a whole lot less time. But they didn't know what they was getting into, but they didn't even consider. But when presented with what many people would say was an appealing offer they said nah we want those two guys their thoughts were wicked continually that's why God destroyed it why did God destroy the earth in Noah's day with water because man's thoughts were evil and it grieved God God regret or repented of the fact that he allowed man to get that bad of shape but Noah found grace Grace is always available, no matter what dispensation you're at in the Bible. Even in the tribulation period, there's a way for people to find grace in the eyes of God and, uh, you know, be saved. But see, the wicked, they don't care about that. Their thoughts are only devoted to, how can I make myself feel better today? If it's just for a minute, if it's just for a second, they'll do anything. Well, when the wicked cometh, verse number 3 says, then cometh also contempt. You know what contempt is? Contempt is hatred or standoffishness towards something that's different. Somebody that is completely after the flesh will bring strife and conflict to anybody that's trying to live for God. Well, this is Sunday school. Right? I don't know. Only God knows. But I assume that most of y'all saved. You love Jesus. That's great, but you can be saved and revert to the carnal man. And if you get to the point that you're living after the desires of the heart, you're bringing contempt to your soul which is saved and the Spirit of God which seals your soul and indwells you. You are at war with yourself and war with God. There's contempt between you and God. There's contempt between your flesh and your spirit. And I can promise you that first off the Apostle Paul said he didn't want to do that because lest he become cast away. But also, if you're at war with yourself, you will be above everybody else most miserable. Perpetually miserable. I'm convinced some of the most miserable people on this earth are those that have tasted the grace of God and received salvation and then rejected it to return to the life that they had before. Because their conscience tells them that they should be back in the house of God. The Holy Ghost is telling them that they should be in the house of God. Their own spirit, desire, your spirit after you get saved, only can survive on the things of God. It desires, because you've been saved, it's been washed. It's not sinful anymore. It craves the things of God for life. To sustain it. That's what keeps you going. And when you're starving your spirit... Your spirit cries out to God. Why do you think the Bible says that God turns some over to the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved? Because your soul is begging God, Lord, do something to keep them from bringing contempt. Well, then it also says that when the wicked come, that cometh also contempt with 
Ig, ignominy, nominee. I looked it up. There's a whole bunch of different pronunciations. Okay. Ignominy, reproach, and with ignominy, reproach. Okay, well, ignominy, ignominy, however you want to say it. That word means shame. Open embarrassment. Well, you may not be embarrassed in this. I promise you, if you're living wicked, you're going to be embarrassed a few times. It may be in a mugshot. It may be sitting on a church pew. It may just be God embarrassing you internally. It may not be outwardly. But I promise you, if you went to the grave, you know, burning the trail right behind you the, the entire way, you went out in six gear, living completely for self in the flesh, I promise you there's going to be a day where you have complete shame and embarrassment when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ. When you have to look at the one who still bears the nail prints in his hands, still has that spot in his side where they thrust the spear through it, and you have to look him in the eye and hear everything that you did instead of living for him. Instead of hearing how much he loves you, instead of feeling in your soul, the Holy Spirit compel you, I love you. You'll look into the eyes of the one that is love and have to come to terms with the fact that you did not love him. But even here, it says, and with ignominy, reproach. Well, what's reproach? It's correction. That is an adjustment to your life, not by yourself, but by someone that has authority over you. Amen. That's God. If a man be without chastisement, he's a bastard and not a son. If you're one of God's, and you go far enough, you'll experience reproach. Trust me, not fun. Amen. Not a good day. You are not going to enjoy reproach. But reproach is what reveals to you how wrong you really were and brings with that ignominy, that embarrassment, that open shame. And some people have that embarrassment dawn on them. God reveals to them and they're ashamed of what they did, but they stay there. They never get back to the father's house. The prodigal was ashamed that he was in a hog pen. He came to himself one day. God had done a little bit of reproaching on him. And then he had taken it and he had beaten himself up. He convinced himself he wasn't even, you know, deserving to be a servant in the father's house. But he said he was going to go back and beg him for it. Thankfully, the father doesn't demote us when we mess up where we have to be resaved again and you can lose your salvation or you got to go and do so much so many works of penance before God will forgive no he'll come he'll put the rope back on you he'll put a ring on your finger the fatted calf will be saved but you'll always have to bear the marks of that reproach reproach is open correction instruction is private reproach is public I mean, I could take you everywhere in the book of Proverbs almost, where it says that someone that loves wisdom or seeks after wisdom or desires understanding, they receive instruction happily. What's instruction? That's where you're either learning something new or you're finding out how you did it wrong. That's those little red marks on the homework so that when it comes time for the test, you know what the right answer is or you know how to do it. That's instruction. Reproach is when you've got to go to the principal's office and your parents are called in and they say, uh, Jordan's failed the past eight tests. And even though the teachers tried to instruct him, he rejected it. And now we have to deal with this with reproach. We need to correct this action before it goes too far. But even then, it'd be up to me on whether or not I listened to the instruction or whether or not the reproach made an impact on me. But reproach is always public. That's why it comes with shame. You can convince yourself of a lot of things, but when other people really find out what you've been up to, when God reveals to others that you're not what other people thought you were, there's going to be shame. You've got to look at people and say, I wasn't the person that I promised you I would be. I wasn't the church family member that I promised to be when I became a member of the church, which means you agreed to do all them things. And if you don't know what them things are, 
it only took me a month to get through it, so go back and listen to those on YouTube because we don't have enough time to do that today. But basically that says you agree to be the best Christian that you can be for the honor and glory of God. Amen. That whatever God tells you to do, you're going to do it. And reproach says everybody just found out that I lied to them, that I lied to God, that I came in here and lied to their face when I told them that I'd pray for their lost loved ones and went home and never gave it a second thought. That when I had a class to teach or when I got involved in vacation Bible school, that I didn't give it my all. And because of that, maybe someone died and went to hell because I promised God or I promised somebody else that I'd do something. And I didn't give it my all. I didn't teach the lesson the way that God wanted me to teach it. And as a result, that child didn't hear or that adult didn't hear or that person over at the jail didn't hear or that co-worker didn't hear because I desired to find out what was going on in my heart instead of desiring to find out what God wanted. It's all real simple. It's all in verse number one. We find here in verse number one everything that we need and just, let's count it. Thirteen words. Thirteen words. We can find everything that you need to figure out what God wants you to know. What God wants you to know starts in the same place that that life that leads to reproach begins at. Through desire. Amen. You can desire all you want to for your loved ones. Or you can desire all you want to for your children. You can desire all you want to for your friends. But a man has to decide that he desires it for himself. All you can do is control what you do. As much as I can pray for somebody else, as much as I can beg God to show them the right way, I can't affect their choices. But I can control what I desire. Your heart, your spirit, both are furnaces. Whichever one you put more wood into is the one that's going to burn hotter. It's going to, one that, going to be the one that requires more wood more often. It's going to be the one that you've got to keep putting coal into so that the steam engine keeps going down the tracks. Amen. And if you feed something enough, it's all you can do to put enough coal into it to keep the thing moving. I mean, you get on fire for God, it's going to be all you can do to soak up as much of the Bible, soak up as much preaching, to listen to as much singing. I mean, you're going, you're going to be to the point that if it wasn't for the grace of God, God would be on your mind so much you couldn't even do your job on the job because you're thinking about God so much. Because that's what your spirit desires. But the flesh, on the other hand, also has a desire. And we've already covered that. To be what it is, sinful. To give in to what the curse of sin caused it to be. Separated from God, alienated from God, want nothing to do with God. But through desire, a man can find out what God wants him to know. If you're saved, you can find out what God wants you to know, but it starts with a desire, intent. And it has to be real. Because man looketh on the outward appearance, God looketh on the heart. God knows whether you feign that desire or whether you sincerely mean it. God knows whether or not when you bow your head and pray, if you really repented of something, or if you just said you were sorry. And you were sorry because you got called out on it, and you're sorry that you have to suffer reproach. Reproach is to bring about repentance, to turn from it, to change your desire, to ask God to change your heart, and restore it to where it was supposed to be. Amen. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect, but if your desire is to know what God wants you to know, when you mess up, you're going to get it made right. Whether it's instruction where God privately deals with you, or a preacher hits on a point during the middle of the, you know, church, one of the three services throughout the week. When you receive the instruction, if you've got the desire, you'll correct it there. But then sometimes, we're like Jordan which is hard-headed. And hey, I got my dad's hard head and my mom's stubbornness. I'm doomed. Okay? And y'all think I'm kidding. 
He's hard headed and she'll dig her heels in. But if we're hard headed like me, maybe instruction doesn't take the first time or the second or the third. And maybe we have to suffer reproach. But the shame of realizing that we disappointed God will rekindle our desire to get back closer to God. It's all about which one we feed more. Which one we... Because your, your spirit... I mean, y'all may never experience it, but, but John, we're just going to be transparent right here. You can be living wrong, but when you get to church, your spirit's going to enjoy them singing. You're going to get them goosebumps. And then eventually God's going to deal with you and say, hey, you remember when you was listening to this music in the car? You remember when you was listening to this when you was doing chores around the house? You remember when you used to listen to preaching when you was working and doing chores? Right? You remember when every... It didn't matter what was going on in church. If there was somebody vacuuming, you was out there helping because you just love being around the things of God. Right? If you drove by and you saw the gate was open, you stopped in just to see what was happening around the house of God. It'll remind you of your desire that your spirit still has. Maybe living sinful, but you get to the house of God, if you're one of God's children, part of you is going to enjoy it. The flesh isn't going to like it, but your spirit is going to say, hey, you remember when we used to have that all the time? You remember how that was a whole lot better than what we got now? What is it? That's your spirit, again, still alive. It's alive forevermore if you're saved. It's never going to suffer destruction. Or that second death, which is being thrown into the lake of fire. Never have to deal with that. It's going to be alive forevermore. But when you get around God, it reminds you, hey, remember when our whole life was alive instead of dead? It's that desire. Even your own spirit, you get around people of God or the things of God. It reminds you, you remember when we used to have a great time all the time because we was walking with Jesus? It's still there. But if the other one's stronger, you won't think about it. Same goes for if you feed the desire for the things of God to know what God wants you to know. Then the desires of the flesh don't seem so strong. You'll be looking for the way of escape in all those temptations because you love God more than what the flesh desires. You'll be praying ahead of time, Lord, I know that I'm human. I know I'm going to face temptation. Give me the verse I need this morning so that when I face the temptation later, I have what I need to keep my desire for you strong. I have the answer ahead of time. It's always good if you buy the fire extinguisher before the kitchen catches on fire. Well, God will equip you with the whole armor of God if we desire to put it on. But then, through desire, a man having separated himself... Oh, more commitment. Because if you desire something, you'll commit to it. If you want it, you'll make sure that there's a way that you get it. If you want it bad enough, nothing's going to stop you. What did Daniel do when he heard the news that they passed a law that said he wasn't allowed to pray to God but had to ask the king for everything for 30 days? He went and prayed. He separated himself. He said, rain, shine, free or, by, or bond. Whether I'm a slave or whether I'm one of the presidents of the king's country. He was one of, chief, one of three chief. One of three and he was the chief of them. That's what I was trying to say. He was second in command of the whole kingdom. But a long time before that he said, if they try to make me eat things that God said I ought not eat, I'm going to eat a whole bunch of stew, essentially. Vegetable broth. Lentils. I'm going to eat nothing and just have faith that God will bless me. And he did, because him, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they all looked stronger and healthier than everybody else that had been chowing down on the all-you-can-eat buffet. Long before he ever got thrown into the lion's den, Daniel said, I'm just going to live the way that God tells me to. He separated him. Well, what are we separating ourselves from and then separating ourselves to? We separate ourselves from the desires of the flesh because we are separating ourselves to a relationship with Christ. I can walk and talk through His Word, through prayer, through the Holy Spirit talking to me. Every day, I can talk with the one that made me, that spun this earth to where it spins once, roughly, every day, and then 
they, there's a little bit more than that. That's why this month we've got 29 days instead of, you know, 28, like most Februarys. Right? That it takes so long to go around the sun that the moon goes in a certain trajectory through the sky. And that depending on where it's at, it's a full moon. It's a new moon. It's something in between. A waxing or a waning moon. The one that did all that wants to tell me what's best for my life. I separate myself from the desire so that I can have a relationship with Almighty God. I separate myself from those things that I know that I'm not strong in. That's called humility. Knowing your strengths and weaknesses. Well, man, I, I really used to like to do that, but because I used to do that, I ended up hanging out with other people. They weren't good influences. The Bible does say not to be une unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It's not just talking about marriage. It's talking about in your life. Don't hitch your cart to the wrong group of people. Why? Because they're going to drag you away from God, not closer to God. I separate myself from certain things and certain people so that I can be holy. Because he said, be holy for I am holy. Because my relationship with him, he can work on me like the potter works on the clay and make me into what I ought to be. But I don't do it so that I can say I'm holy. I desire holy so I can be like him. That I can be appeasing or pleasing unto the Father. That I realize I was bought with a price and my life's no longer my own. Lord, do with me whatever you want to. I just want to be pleasing unto you. Because how many times have we heard, God's not interested in your ability, but your availability. If you desire to be used of God, God will use you. Doesn't matter whether the world thinks you can get the job done or not, God's going to use you. Doesn't matter if you think that you can get the job done. Go see Moses. God's going to use you. It's not about what you did or where you're at now. It's what God can turn you into. So I separate myself from where I'm at now because I understand, even though I may not know where it's at, God has a better thing in mind for me. And in order to do it, I have to separate myself to Him. And we separate ourselves from selfishness to service. They say, through polls and through interviews and exit but they say that the thing that most people enjoy or that the thing that people enjoy most is being able to help or being able to do something for somebody else makes them feel warm and fuzzy on the inside but when you realize that the God of all creation who made you who did everything without you desires to use you that's a humbling thing but it also sparks a desire down here that says I want to be used to God. I want to serve the Lord. I'm not the one calling the shots. I'm just happy doing what he wants me to do. I'm happy being what he wants me to be, but I'm also happy doing what he wants me to do. And I don't care how he tells me to do it. I'm going to do it because I love him. Because I desire the relationship with him more than anything else in the world. Because he's that precious to me. Sister Brandy sings that Jesus is precious. He is precious, but is he precious to you? Is that desire there? But finally, through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. It's not enough to have the desire to be what God wants you to be. You got to pursue it. As some people say, you got to put some footsteps on your prayers. Well, Lord, I desire you to do this, so on faith, I'm just going to seek it out. Not doing anything contrary or hindering the Spirit of God or what God would want to do. But Lord, I want you to help that person. I want you to save that person. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to start reading and finding the tracks and praying over them and saying, well, Lord, is this the track that you want me to give? Lord, is this the track that you'd like me to hand out? Lord, I didn't even know some of the stuff in this track. That was good stuff. And all the while you're doing that, God may not have wanted you to be the one to give him the track. But because you showed how committed you were to it, God may have sent somebody else by their way. You may not have been the one that got to tell them about Jesus, but because your desire was made into action, because you were so serious about it that you went out to go do something about it, 
God was moved, like we heard Wednesday night, moved with compassion towards us and did for us what we could not do for ourselves. It's one thing to say that, well, yeah, I desire to live holy. Well, how serious are you? Have you junked the stuff that you added to your life that God told you not to and you did it anyway? Because some things, if you put it there, God wants you to remove it. He's not going to remove it for you. You have to undo what you did wrong to show that you really repented of it, that you've turned from it. That song to Sister Gloria used to sing, let him in my secret place. What was that? That's you opening the door to that room in your heart where you keep the things that are most precious to you and saying, Lord, we need junk all this stuff. I put it here and now it's too big for me, but I want you to help me get it out. Help me. We're not going to do a yard sale either where we give it to somebody. We're going to just burn it. Let's get rid of it. Because I know it's not good for anybody else to be given to them. Amen. What is that? That's being serious about it. When you do business with God, business will pick up. Sometimes you do business through prayer. Sometimes you do business through doing what you ought to do. You know that you should do. For a man to know what to do good and do it not to him and to sin. But sometimes you have to go that extra mile. You've got to seek it out. God said that if his people, which are called by his name, will humble themselves and turn from their way and seek his face. Wasn't enough to humble themselves and say, Lord, we were wrong. They had to pursue God. Show them that they weren't content with where they were, so they were going back to where they knew God was. Well, sometimes you just got to step out on faith. When it doesn't make sense, when you don't know how God's going to do it. And if you're serious, if you're seeking it, God will show you what to do. God will show you what you ought to know. When you show God, well, you know what, Lord? I can always DVR that. You know what, Lord? Half of the episodes are boring anyway. I'm going to cut it out just to get in here a little bit more. Or, Lord, I'm going to wake up a little bit earlier so that I can read a few verses. Or, Lord, while I'm brushing my teeth, I'm going to listen to some preaching. And not just have it on in the background, but actually pay attention. What is all that? That's seeking. And he promised that if you seek, you shall find. Yeah, ask, you shall receive. And if you knock, it's going to be opened unto you. Why? Because your desire is not for you. Your desire is to be more like Him. And that was the will of the Father. That's what the Calvinists or people that believe in predestination, that's what they don't understand. It was predestinated that those which were called by Christ, saved by Christ, would be conformed to the image of Christ. That's the will of the Father. And if you're desiring to do the will of the Father, and if you're trying to do it by faith, and relying on God to do it, the Father will fulfill his own will he will do it but you got to desire it and it starts there then you've got to separate then you got to seek and then you'll get to the point where you know so much about God God's got so much of himself in you you can't tell where one starts and the other one ends and that is truly victorious Christian living if you enjoyed today's broadcast head on over to your app store and download the IBC forms app today where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.